What up, meatheads? This is Travis, American Butcher, and this is the Meat Blog Podcast, the podcast by butchers for everyone. And this week's is a Q&A with me. And before I get started, I just want to say big thanks to a small good company or small good co or at small goods or at a small good. They sent me some amazing salami and they're based in Maine and I want you to check them out. I want you to support them. And if you want to send me amazing dry cured items or any kind of meat related items, please just DM me and and send them away because I I love eating those things and I I want my honest opinion. I'm going to give it to you. If it's me, I'm going to love it. And let's now start podcasting. Good cutting enhances the quality of good meat. In his way, the meat cutter is an artist. Poor cutting results in an inferior piece of meat, regardless of quality. All right. What up, guys? This is Travis American Butcher. And I got all these questions from Instagram. I uploaded a picture, uh, used it as clickbait so I could get you guys to look at it on Instagram at my on my personal Instagram or not personal, I guess the American butcher Instagram, not the meat blocking Instagram. But anyway, I asked for Q and A's and this is what I got. Dr. Smokehouse asked dry aging seems to be more popular, but can you give an opinion on wet aging and wet aging is typically, uh, when, uh, subprimals like a, a tenderloin or a strip loin or New York, I mean, not a New York or a ribeye because strip loin and New York are the same thing, but they're broken down at a processing facility, put into a cryo bag, cryovac, and then usually gone through a shrink tape, dip tank, I mean, or shrink tunnel. And then it goes to the, like a Costco or a Winco. Or if you live on the East Coast, a Hannaford's. If you live in California, a Ralph's. Uh, a Piggly Wiggly if you're in other parts of the country or a food co or a food for less or many uh, cash and carry perhaps. Um, I don't know if you work at a at a meat department in a chain store. Let me know. I, w- I love hearing unique ones that I've never heard before. Albertsons, Sprouts. Maybe Trader Joe's. No, not Trader Joe's. Uh, Whole Foods is a popular one. Anyway, please let let me know. I I just love things like that. But anyway, so this subprimal that is in this bag, from the time it is cut until the time it is ready for the display case, is usually in that bag for 30 days. Now, personally, I don't know if they're um if it's logistically if this is just the time it takes to run through that cycle it seems like there could be a quicker turnaround with this but what i do know is that it helps with the yield of selling the overall product because all the purge is left in the bag and you could also uh charge for that weight when it goes through or the department store ends up paying not department store it'd be weird if you could find box product in a macy's or a J.C. Penney's or Sears. Well, I'm not going to play that game again. But anyway, when it goes to your grocery store, um, they end up paying for that purge weight, and that purge is lost. Uh, when it's taken out of the bag, you let it bloom, get that sulfuristic fart smell out of the, the bag, and then it's trussed up, you know, and then further further cut, put in beautiful displays by you beautiful meat workers and counter help and... Um, uh, and sold to the general public. Now, what does that do, that 30-day period? So that 30-day period does uh, make it more tender. It loses that moisture that you would when you uh, dry age something. You know, you lose such, I think it's like uh, 10% a week. Nah, don't quote me on that. Well, you can Um that moisture loss during the dry aging process makes it the meat taste more like the meat. Now, when you when you cut open that bag and you open it up and the purge comes out, that purge is ninety percent water, and it's seven uh, percent 
uh, meat protein and then 3% fat protein. So it, it could have the same effect if you see it in that way where, you know, it make it may bring out the actual flavor because you're tasting less water than you would. This process also tenderizes it and helps denude the proteins, but not as much as dry aging. So after all that, what is my opinion on wet aging? I see it as a way that the packing houses could improve their margin. Um, I see it also just as a, a buzzword or a marketing word. I also know that it, my opinion, it, it doesn't sell like dry age. I've never heard someone be impressed being like, ooh, that, that's, that's wet age right there. Um, it's, I could tell you that a majority of the meat that people eat is going to have this 30 day lag process or ground beef or not ground beef, just beef in general. Uh, pork doesn't because it has different shelf lives. But yeah, um, if you're listening to this show and you have an opinion about it, that's, different than mine or just more insight about why it, why this happens, please let us know um, at the meat block on Instagram. All right. Butcher ladder asks best way to cook a scotch tender. And here is the simplest best recipe for a scotch tender, also known as the uh, mock tender in some circles. Some old world butchers may call it the Jewish tender. I find this uh, not PC. I, I think it's an inappropriate term. And if you y use that term, maybe consider calling it the mock tender. The reason it's called the mock tender is because, to quote, this farmer I used to uh, work with, that um, it's not... A, the mock tender is is not very tender. It it's not. It, it's a very um, it's like a working muscle, but it doesn't have the big uh, muscle grains that like an eye round would. But if you want to know where the Scotch tender is, it's on the other side of the ridge bone on the scapula, which is separated from your flat iron and is on your one side. Then on the other side of that ridge bone is your mock tender. So when I used to work in cutting wraps, uh, we would seam out this piece, and you can seam it out. Uh, you could uh, make like stew meat out of it. Uh, when we worked, when I worked in retail, we would take this, cut little medallions out of it, and then uh, run it through a jacar and tenderize it for. Uh, the customer and the number one easiest recipe for this is you're going to take, you know, you could take a couple of them and put them through your meat grinder and make burgers. It will be very lean, but I think textually it will be the easiest and quickest thing to do. Amy on Instagram asks, uh, my daughter apprentice at a local butcher shop, for one and a half years. How can she continue her education in butchery? Is it all all on the job training? I would say on the job training is the best. Um, I don't know what what country you're in. I know that if you do apprenticeships in I know if you do apprenticeship programs in uh, parts of Europe and in Australia that it holds a little bit more weight than it does here in America because both those countries have established programs to, you know, from apprenticeship to journeyman to butcher to, to the next step to what you need to be a master butcher and all these things where in America we don't really have that put in place. And I know people like um, mostly wild and free are trying to explore options through culinary programs and things like that to help make a standard of identity of what the term means when someone says they're a butcher. You no, know, Carrie Underly is also exploring the education realm with her uh, online classes. 
And it's something that the WBC, the World Butchers Challenge, is also trying to answer. Um, you know, in, in parts of the world, it doing an apprenticeship program, at the end of the apprenticeship program, by all means, you're a butcher. In America, to further your education, just because apprenticeship programs get changed very much state to state, shop to shop, even one shop in one city, drive 10 miles to a shop in another city where majority of people in America may not work with a side of, uh, a side of beef, may work with, you know, box products when shops that only work with sides of beef may never know how to push margins on box products. Um, so my advice and one thing I was fortunate when I was starting off in this industry or when I was younger in my life before I had, you know, my wonderful family is I, I was in the position to move uh, for work and each place I worked, uh, I just had this mental goal that within six months I could do, you know, like put myself in the position that regardless of what my role at that company is that I could step in anywhere and, and help be it with the ordering or be it with, you know, something as weird as delivering or running the sausage or the smokehouse and, you know, things like that. I uh, acquired my skills more or less because of uh, two things, my willingness to move around the country for job opportunities and the willingness of people who worked at these places to, to teach me. Um, and both those things are very important. Uh, and one thing I don't want to do in this industry is have, you know, gatekeepers or anything like that. And that's the whole point of this podcast is uh, I will do my best to answer the questions. By no means do I know all the answers, but I want to build the community where no one feels... Um, People could ask the question and uh, and not have to deal with bullshit uh, gatekeeping or blah, 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 swinging dicks or whatever. But yes, I just want to say thank you for the question. And I hope my answer was helpful. At Clotimus Maximus asks, how do you decide how long to keep the bone when you cut your cowboy steaks? Seen it done several ways all right i just want to for the person who may not know for the uh chef or for just the average listener cowboy steak is a ribeye typically cut in between the rib bones and that rib bone is frenched uh usually about a, a two inches maybe and it, an extreme version of this is a tomahawk and cowboy steaks is because the cowboy steaks looks like a little gun and the tomahawk looks like a tomahawk. So cowboy and Indians for obvious reasons. And that ribeye bone, if, you know, you imagine it on the carcass, continues into your plate meat, into your sh uh, short ribs or your plate short ribs, not your cross ribs. Or the second set, uh, you know, your six to uh, 13 ribs. There's seven and it's because they, when you cut an export off of a whole carcass, the export is the last, uh, not the last, it's the um, seven ribs after the chuck. You end up with a, a piece still on the loin. And if you're a whole carcass shop, just as a word of advice, when preparing for um, Christmas, cut your chuck at four bones and snag that extra loin off the uh the drop loin so you get to end up with a nine bone export but anyway so cowboy steak how do you determine that size when you break it off so there there are specific rules as far as going two inches off the eye and to cut an export that's standardized with like packing houses and things like that but when, so if you get a boxed export, a ribeye, what is a 107D uh, export, 
what you want to do is never cut into that eye is you always want to leave that intact and i know some people will bring it all the way down to that eye and almost like denude it and it does look great but from my experience when i cut new york so when i cut ribeyes i want to leave that on there i think it just looks good and helps the margin but so leave that on there and cut about uh two inches above it and you could score and french it and if you have a little bit more bone on there than uh, usual, or if it's a big animal, still go by this and just have a little bit longer bone. Um, and what determines the length of that bone, you know, is determinedly within two inches. But if you're breaking whole carcasses, you could, if you're not selling short ribs or if you need to fatten up your grind, uh, you could cut that plate almost you know all the way up to the navel and make your tomahawks and make it any size when i worked retail uh what we would do is make tomahawks after a day if we they didn't sell i'd take half those tomahawks off and knock off the bone and call them cowboy steaks and if they those didn't sell i'd take them out uh debone them uh and butterfly them and stick those in the case as heart ribeyes you know, you just play with it. But my advice is just keep that eye intact and also don't French too high above that that mark. It looks weird uh, when you have too much meat past that eye. And I, I coined this, but if you sell like a tomahawk or a cowboy steak with, uh, and it's not French, but it's still that giant piece, uh, instead of calling it either of those, I call them a freedom chop. And it's freedom because you're free to do with that margin what you want because you're selling a lot of weight there. Uh, at Bearded Butcher asks, do you think all beef is created equal? As in steak is steak, as long as you know how to cook it properly, buying meat low price from uh, cash and carry compared to buying it higher end retail, uh, I'll, uh, will you get the same result? Um, so, you know, some people knock places like Cash and Carry, which is like a place where you go and you buy IBP select or choice for super cheap um, versus like going to a more boutique shop and paying uh, half your paycheck to eat consciously. Uh, if you've listened to previous episodes, I never want to shame people for why they spend money on food or how they spend their money on food uh eating ethically can a quote unquote may be very expensive and i never want to shame someone i certainly as a parent know it's sometimes easier when you're driving to go with the less ethical option and stopping in a fast food place versus uh making sure you have all the proper road snacks um we need both of these places to exist to serve our, the the current um, market in America and around the world. Now, as far as steak is steak, I do buy these great bargain deals that I see at places like Cash and Carry. I even shop at Cash and Carry myself. Um, we'll pick up like a whole Chuck Primal and you know for my family and. You know, I do a lot of smoking with the stuff or almost exclusively smoking with the stuff I buy at a place like this, you know, because you can get whole primals. Um, and it, I get the flavor that I, that I expect to get out of the beef that I could taste my seasoning. You know, I could certainly tell it's grain finished. Um, it tastes like most meat people get in a restaurant when you look past the flavor. Um, as far as quality, it is wholesome and I find it enjoyable when I eat. Now, other things like this may, like red meat is going to, you know, prime is obviously going to have a different flavor profile than select. So saying steak is steak in that realm, you certainly would have to cook it different, um, create a different dish. But pork is the one where I would buy 
more or less commodity pork when it comes to bellies and shoulders. But as far as the texture and wiltiness that I find in commodity pork loins and the denudedness that they do on it, I don't know what I could do besides curing it and slicing it that would make it have a flavor profile that I want personally. And we need to, or I guess we don't need to do anything really, but it's important to figure out ways to utilize all the undesirable cuts. You know, when you say steak is steak, a lot of people will look down at, at um, certain cuts, but whole carcass utilization like we discussed in our uh, rendering episode is is important because every bit of the animal is it was raised to serve a purpose and for us to make the best use out of it will help ensure that that existence of that animal was not in vain so i may sound hippie-ish or whatever but the best way to show respect to the cycle is to give it the best possible outcome that, uh, and we make it into something that we could enjoy. Certainly. I don't know if that answers your question. It's just my thoughts I have on this right now. At Bearded Butcher has another question. Uh, Off topic, back when you were moving from Vermont to California, you'd post videos of you lip singing to Biggie and Wu-Tang and et cetera. Any chance of you bringing that back? Yeah, I, I, I used to post a lot of weird stuff. Um, not weird stuff, just more personal stuff. Um, when more and more people started following me, I kind of cut back on that. Um, and more wanted to focus my quote-unquote online presence, as lame as that sounds, on cutting-related and butcher-related. Um, every once in a while in my Instagram stories, I will post me uh, lip syncing to stuff or stage diving on my bed. Not very, very often. Maybe, maybe I'll start again. Um, Yeah. At C3 or F61 uh, asks, what's the definition of a Delmonico steak? I've heard it called many things uh, having Many different names to describe the Delmonico. And for instance, then she lists a bunch of stuff. <clears throat> I've also heard it called many things. For example, um, I, w- I did some moonlighting cutting for this place. And they called uh, the five bones on the chuck the first two bones. And you French that down, leaving the cross rib section. Uh, bone on so you have a boneless cross rib and then you essentially make a bone in tomahawk uh, chuck eye steak off of the first two bones I've heard that described as a Delmonico I worked with this guy in Vermont who just said the first uh, two cuts off the ribeye were the Delmonico uh, from the chuck end. And then I recently heard that the last uh, cut, the last bone on the ribeye going towards the short loin at two inches is the Delmonico. And then in the past, I've wanted to know this for myself. And they, I've heard, you know, people call parts of the sirloin the, a Delmonico steak. Now, what I truly think a Delmonico is, and Delmonico Steakhouse in New York, first of all, Delmonico Steakhouse doesn't serve a steak. It's a roast that is a boneless export cut table side. And they it's cut to order where they bring out this ch- like rolling cart chafing dish with this beautiful trust boneless ribeye and you say i want this this much and they cut it for you right there and then they have they toss the salad at table side and they do all this fancy shit and it's all table side um i think i watched a show on it years ago on the travel channel like uh you know back when they'd be like 
best burger in America, best steak in America. And you just watch that block of travel channel hung over. And, but to me, what a Delmonico truly is, is it comes from, it straddles the chuck in the ribeye. And I'd say it's the first two inches of the chuck eye boneless and the first two inches of the ribeye on the chuck end. Um, and they're both boneless cut uh, thicker at that two inches. So you get four per beef. Um, write in. Tell me. Uh, let me know I'm wrong or let me know I'm right at the Meat Block Podcast on Instagram or at American Butcher on Instagram as well. And this question comes from Daniel on Instagram. Uh, first part of the question is just giving praise about the podcast. Thank you. Uh, I'd love to hear an episode uh, that mentions tricks for reducing refrigerator and freezer noise and making your customer service area welcome and inviting and work. Uh, I've worked at shops that had such loud coolers that it was hard to hear the customers. Yeah, that certainly sounds like a problem. I would hate to work in a place where the coolers were so loud that it uh, was over uh louder than the customers uh what kind of coolers are these i'm i'm wondering to myself i've worked with like uh, i think it was torre coolers had a beautiful self-contained cooling unit that was all right there and it was so it, it for a self-contained unit that literally we put it on casters and it had uh storage underneath and we could uh we would bring it to a farmer's market and it was whisper quiet to the point where I was scared if it was on, I had to feel the hum. Um, it was such a beautiful cooler. Man, I don't work for that company, or they don't, I'm not affiliated, but that's, there's some uh, buzz marketing, I guess, right there. Um, they also make great sauce, too. But first thing I would recommend is when designing a shop is putting your uh, condensers, because most shops... Uh, don't have amazing self-contained coolers with everything built in right in. They're going to have condensers that are usually going to be run onto uh, the roof of the shop. And that's where a majority of your noise is going to be. I would make sure that those pipes are insulated so you don't get transfer noise or vibration, just like how I have a boom arm for my microphone with a shock mount that is going to minimize the transfer of me hitting my microphone that I don't get these vibration noises. So always wrap your pipes um, and then have something. If that doesn't work, uh, I would look at your cooler, uh, make sure it's level, make sure that it, it, because what you're hearing is you're hearing reverberation of the vibrating, of it rattling. So I would shim up the legs, make sure it's level, make sure it's sitting right. And if that doesn't work, then um, call a, a cooler maintenance person and, and have them service you. Or next time you do have them service, you should have them service once a year uh, to winterize and summarize your uh, condensers and, you know, check your Freon levels, make sure there's no cracks or anything like that. And just ask uh, that professional what they would recommend. It could be as simple as uh, a small crack in your Freon line, but then again, your cooler wouldn't work at that point. Uh but yeah, I would try, if it's something that could be shimmed or putting like a piece of foam in some weird rattling part that like I knew I drove this car that when I would get to a certain speed, my dash would get into this feedback for reverberation where like, but if as soon as I put my hand on it, it would shut the fuck up. So yeah, try things like that. Um, Danny, or not Danny. Uh, Daniel, I hope that was helpful and glad you liked the show. Um, Mike on Instagram asks, ever find an abscess in the neck part of a beef? How do you deal with it? And yes, I have found abscess in the neck uh, of beef. More or less, I find them a lot more in pork. And what is a abscess? Well, an abscess is... uh, it's essentially like a pimple. It's a bunch of uh, white blood cells 
or, or typically when it's like that pussy color that smells awful, uh, sent someplace to fight an infection. And what causes a abscess is the um, in the neck area is genuinely because there's a gland around the check chuck at the base of the neck of uh, beef. Same gland is in sheep, humans, and pigs. Uh, we all pretty much have similar anatomy and muscle structure. And you can tell when these glands uh, are fighting an infection because they're, they get grayer, they get maybe a little bit grainy and they change and they swell. Um, so when you check the glands and you notice this, there may be an abscess nearby. Or if you find an abscess, check the gland that's closer to it being in the growing or, uh, you know, in the stomach on uh, beef, they check that, or around the lungs or in this chuck area. Um, just like when you get a sore throat or you get sick, you can feel your gland swell because they're producing uh, antibodies that go help fight the infection. And most of these irritants are either from like what they would call um, hardware, if it's like close to the surface of the hide where they may have brushed up against something or something poked through them and caused an irritation and caused an abscess like barbed wire or a piece of metal. Um, hardware is also found in the stomach when cows are eating uh, hay bales or they'll just scoop up a piece of metal. I've certainly pulled hundreds of magnets out of uh, dairy cows because they make, they don't make, but it's not uncommon practice to feed dairy cow magnets so they will collect the metal uh, that they inadvertently eat just through uh, silage and mowing and uh, just machinery. You'd be surprised how much metal, metal uh, pieces are on the average magnet you find. So that's one way abscess can occur. Um, sometimes irritation in muscle, like you'll find them in the seams of muscles, like and where two muscles meet will separate and abscess will form. Uh, and they smell bad. They look like guacamole sometimes. Um, and they're gross and they're essentially... Uh, not wholesome in the sense. So it's our responsibility to make sure that that doesn't go out to the general public to eat. So what do we do? Uh, if you find an abscess, it's not uh, that the whole animal is bad. It's just that area needs to be uh, cleaned and removed. Um, and if you find yourself cutting, and you cut through one on your block. The first thing you should do is sanitize your knife, change your gloves, Excess, did it get on your apron? Did it get on your poly top on your block? Did it get on your sleeve? And then if you, that the answer is yes, uh, you know, change your apron, your sleeve, etc. If it's on your poly top of your block, uh, don't move the meat yet. Get a clean knife and clean PPE and cut uh, around the abscess as if you're uh, removing the access, abscess by trimming, that you don't want the plane of your knife to touch the pus. You want it to cut the meat underneath where it's sitting. Then you're going to throw that away. Uh, and you're going to cut all that off and cut, not wipe it off because you would be spreading bacteria if you did that and it would be counter productive and unwholesome and then pick up your meat once it's cut off moved it to a clean polytop and clean and re-sanitize your current polytop um, and if you're running your bands on this is the worst when you're cutting pork shoulders and you come across one of these you really uh, I know a lot of people may not do this but I encourage you to Clean your saw, do a, do a sanitation cycle, maybe ditch that piece of meat that you're cutting because that high velocity on that saw blade may 
push that uh, to places where you may not see it and certainly change your PPE and your frock and sanitize your knives and go through a sanitation cycle, essentially. And it sucks. Um, the food safety system isn't perfect. Uh, it could have had this and the animal could have been feeling fine. It may not have been visible and the lymph node may have uh, went back down to a normal size or the lymph node uh, may have been one that they don't normally check, uh, such as the ones deep in the shoulders because they normally check the ones on the head and the lungs. So I hope that answered your question. At Jamie Waldron ask, uh, I'd be interested in hearing a show about your manage, management styles and how you... All right, that's going to do it for this week's episode of the Meat Block Podcast. I hope you enjoyed it. And uh, we got some stuff in whip right now. Blech. Right now, Ryan's working on some uh, interviews, and we're going to get one of those out pretty soon. Um, we got some great pieces, and we need ideas for shows, uh, maybe broader topics. Uh, I love doing these Q&As, and I still want to do these, and these are great. Uh, please send your questions in. These are great episodes and easy to produce. Um, and if you want to contact us, the best way to do that is email us at the meat block podcast at gmail.com. Tweet us at the meat block pod. No one does, but maybe, maybe you will Instagram us at the meat block. And of course our Facebook group at the meat block as well. Uh, head over there, be part of the conversation. If you want to support the show, best way to do that is open up your podcast listening device. However, you're listening to this. Some people may be listening to it on uh, YouTube. Leave a comment and please leave the highest review they give on, for example, iTunes would be five stars. YouTube would be a thumbs up. Um, and if you want Another way to support the show is by using the hashtag the meat block. And this week's meathead of the week is at werewolf mode on Instagram. So please follow him. Please check out the amazing things he's doing. And if you want to be the meathead of the week, tag us on social media and use the hashtag the meat block. This outro song is one of my favorite songs of all time. Bonnie Raitt, Angel from Montgomery. And until next time, keep your knives sharp. And live in the heart. I am an old woman named after my mother. My old man is another child. Is Lightning was desire This old house would have burnt down A long time ago Make me an angel That flies from Montgomery Make me a poster Of an old rodeo Just give me one thing I can hold on to To believe in this living Is just a hard way to go When I was a young girl You had a little guy You weren't much to look at Just a free ramp Like a broken down, down Make me an angel Flies from Montgomery Make me a poster Of an old rodeo Just give me one thing That I can hold on to To you believe in this living Is just a Hard way to go This flag
jazz in the kitchen. I can hear all the buzzing. And I ain't done nothing since I woke up today. How the hell can a person go to work in the morning, come home in the evening, and have nothing to say? Just give me one thing I can hold 